Hello, Apple Vision Pro. Exciting. As many of you know, I've spent uh, most of the last 30 years working uh, on and with and for uh, companies that are doing work in uh, spatial computing. In fact, 30 years almost to the day. Before there was Apple Vision, there was Disney Vision, um, which uh, 1994, Disney Quest, $250,000 per eye. Look it up. Incredible system. Um, but here we are at just as important of a milestone in our lifelong journey into spatial and immersive computing, and it is awesome. And so, so many of my lifelong collaborators uh, and investor colleagues have reached out to me to share my thoughts. And um, after giving this answer a few times, I thought I'd bottle up into a, into a kind of a shape charge video to share my top line insights. Um, just to state the obvious, there are way better qualified creators than me uh, out there to be able to give you a true review of the, the Apple Vision Pro, most notably The Verge. I'm a longtime Verge fanboy. Um, and Nilay Patel's review is exquisite. Just the right amount of technology, but also talks about the utility and the, and the current state of affairs. Of, of course, MKBHD's reviews, both of his are incredible. Um, and then uh, there's other really fun ones. Joanna Stern of Wall Street Journal takes it skiing because they're, you know, ski goggles um, uh, with supervision. <laughs> but then and then also, you know, you've probably seen Casey Nestat takes it out in the streets of New York City. I mean, all of these give kind of different perspectives on this interesting device. I think it's really cool that the tech journalist community has really been activated by this quite new and unique um, device and Apple's execution and the pros and cons therein. So uh, I assume that most of you watching this video have seen some subset of those, but if you haven't, you should, because they're great. And I'm going to cover actually quite different things in our time together. Um, so I've actually structured my thoughts into five top line bullets, kind of categories or chapters of this video. You can jump in and out whenever you want as appropriate, um, but it'll maybe contextualize not only a little bit of a snapshot of the device and whether or not you should spend $3,500 on it. <laughs> um, spoiler alert, I've chosen that, although I'll buy them for companies that I'm collaborating with, I'm not going to purchase one for personal use in this generation. I almost definitely will in the next generation. Um, this is not a reflection of how, how impressed I am with the hardware, as you'll hear, but there are specific reasons that you'll also hear why I don't think it's time, at least for my own uh, personal use, that I'm going to purchase a device. However, I did get the, the full official Apple demo, and I can reflect um, in a fair amount of depth on the experiential and technical and design execution of the object uh, that might help uh, inform you, particularly given that I've spent many, many hundreds of hours in different AR, VR, and MR systems in years past. So here goes. Bullet number one. Apple's entered the spatial computing category. Woohoo! <laughs> you know, I have long said privately and on stage that Apple's entry into this category will represent a very important waypoint and indicator in our lifelong journey to truly immersive computing. And this is for a bunch of reasons. Obviously, their design and technical execution is always exceptional, but also they have so much ecosystem momentum, given that all of us plug into iOS in, or in one way or another, them bringing that to your eyewear will unlock all kinds of really incredible use cases. But there are a couple details about Apple's execution of a spatial computing headset that are unique to Apple and I want to just focus on in this first chapter. So the first one, maybe the most obvious one, is just kind of uppercase D design execution in all of its dimensions. Um, fit and finish and material selection, uh, is, industrial design, it's just gorgeous. It is a beautiful object. It might even be the most beautiful consumer electric electronics object in the history of humankind at the time of this video, like just this absolutely amazing object. And sure, it's a little heavy. I'm not even going to speak to that in this video. Others have done so. In subsequent generations, it'll get lighter. I'm not worried about that. Yeah, there's an external battery. That's a little bit of a bummer. Again, these are really smart people making really thoughtful trade-offs. I'm not going to second guess any of those choices. Um, so it is what it is. And that's it doesn't really disrupt the experience too severely in my from my point of view. I actually think that the design stuff is the least interesting of the Apple-ness of the Vision Pro. So the first thing I want to talk about is they've, they've chosen to focus on two very specific, not new technologies, but executed in a way that is very Apple and special. The first one is eye gaze tracking. Eye gaze tracking is not a new technology. I actually used very precise, very sophisticated eye gaze tracking systems when I was at Microsoft Research in the 90s. Um, just to be clear, I'm not talking about head tracking, which is table stakes for any spatial computing system. I'm talking about tracking actually your eyeballs and where you, what you're actually looking at. 
And the thing that might not be obvious to those of you who have never used a contemporary eye gaze tracking system is that these systems are insanely precise. They can, they can ascertain two hit targets that are very close to one another in your kind of foveal, you know, field of view. And, and you can be very, very precise on clicking on those two objects just based on where your eyeballs are looking. So those systems are very mature and clearly Apple is, is wielding the best technologies. Um, and it, it, it does have this kind of mind reading effect. Related to that, different, but but what makes that magical is this kind of hand tracking finger click. Now, to be clear, other systems, both the Quest 2 and Quest 3, actually have pretty exquisite hand tracking. And it's actually used in many of the applications that are deployed in those app stores. Um, so that's not new at all. The thing that is new is that Apple's taken special care to make sure that the cameras that are looking at your movement are actually looking at your side or, or in your lap so that you can actually have your hands at rest in a seated position. Or even if you're standing and your hands at your side, it can see that gesture, which is super important, kind of obvious ergonomics factor. Do you, do you remember back in the 80s, we thought that uh, user interfaces, uh, graphic user interfaces, were going to be used by on a desktop with a touch screen. And that just produces too much arm fatigue, which is why mice were invented to keep your hand resting on the desk while you could interact. In a you know in a in a plane that is perpendicular to your hand, and that works pretty well, mostly because of the fatigue issue. Same exact thing in spatial computing. It's very important that you can click without holding your hand out, and sometimes it makes sense to reach out and touch something, but most of the time you just want to look and click, and that works exceptionally well um, uh, on this headset in a way that only Apple can execute. Great. I will state that neither of those technologies, I think, have kind of a patent moat around them in the way that some of the other Apple UI technologies do. So I think the good news is that others will probably enter that space um, soon in a very real way. Uh, the last area where Apple exquisitely executed much more deeply than the other players in the category actually will spill into the third chapter, uh, which we'll call pass-through technology, which has good news and bad news, I'd say, in this chapter. Um, so I, this is going to require that we just take one step deeper technically and talk about the tech stack that is creating the landscape of spatial computing that leads us to this very moment of mixed reality. Now, Apple's using the term spatial computing. You know, again, they didn't invent that phrase, but that's okay. Uh, these are really great marketers and I think it's wise for them to rise above the alphabet soup of XR, MR, AR, VR, uh, and, uh, and MR. But, uh, but let's actually talk about what those things mean because it's relevant to this specific headset and also the headsets of the future. So XR is just a general term. It's basically the same thing as spatial computing. It means like any combination of the technologies I'm about to talk about. The X uh, can be replaced by any one of a series of different um, terms for what, what reality is this. So the first one and the one that most of you know most well and probably own a device or spend a lot of time in a device is VR. Virtual reality, um, that's actually tiny little screens in front of your eyeballs predominantly designed to transport you into a parallel universe that is not the room that you're in. At the other end of the spectrum, sort of our North Star is augmented reality. And these are actually like transparent lenses. You can actually see through them. So they're transparent display technology. What this means is your actual wetware is looking through those lenses into the real world. Um, and then we're overlaying digital information over top of that um, and juxtapositioning the digital and the physical beautifully together. And these systems are amazing. Unfortunately, we spent the last decade trying to invent really high quality, transparent see-through displays at a consumer price point. And the industry has kind of unanimously determined that like, just not yet. We're not there yet. So what we're doing as an interim, again, as a waypoint on our way to that North Star, is this thing called mixed reality, which uses a series of cameras on the front um, to show you the real world in a VR display on the interior. And it's so funny because of Apple's very um, evocative marketing images where you see the person's eyes through the headset. Many people that I know who are versed in computing, but not necessarily deep in spatial computing, believe that it's a transparent display. It's not at all. I promise you there's a circuit board sitting in front of your eyes. No part of your wetware is seeing the real world. It's this crazy Rube Goldberg machine that takes the real world um, from 12 cameras that are facing out and facing your eyes. And it's taking those outside cameras, it's processing them, it's putting them on the screens, and then it's looking at your eyes and it's reconstructing a digital image of your eyes and putting it on an outside display that with a holographic kind of lenticular looks like it's back on the plane of your eyes so it doesn't look like a you know, creepy mask. I mean, 
it is this space shuttle of technology that, again, Apple has gracefully like backed up a Brinks truck of investment, several, <laughs> to be able to create this unbelievably high fidelity, pass through mixed reality experience. And it is awesome. In addition to that, they've invented incredible micro OLED displays. So you the display like makes reality look better than any other color pass through system has ever looked. In fact, this system, um, the Quest, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the, the Meta Quest 3, um, actually has color pass through technology at one seventh the price of the Vision Pro. But that additional resolution and the additional cameras and actually like literal dedicated silicon, the R1 chip on the Vision Pro, allows the fidelity of that pass-through experience to be so incredibly good. So um, so that sounds like all pretty good, right? I mean, I do think that like our, our ancestors in the future will look back at this moment in the same way that like we look back at steampunk technology in the sense that like we have reverence of what they were able to do with that technology in that day. Um, but also, you know, we think about executing things using very different tools. And it, this moment of time of mixed reality of like, you know, capturing the real world, processing it, centering it to screens and then capturing your eyes and processing it and sending it to screens facing outward. It's almost like remember in the 90s when we tried to like compete with the postal service by by having like gluing a printer to a scanner to a to a modem and then put it the other side of a telephone line with a printer and a scanner and a modem and fax technology basically did that. I mean, we're doing that today to try to simulate the functionality of a literal piece of transparent glass. It is crazy and magical and amazing in all kinds of weird and wonderful ways. So I just want to state for the record, like even very sophisticated technologists have said to me, like, it, you know, there's no way that's actually what's happening. But I, I assure you, there's this unbelievable amount of technology to achieve that. And it works shockingly well. Now, a nice thing about mixed reality as compared to augmented reality, truly transparent lenses is on mixed reality, you kind of get really high quality VR for free. So in those cases that you actually want to present virtual content or you want to transport yourself into a different environment, you can do that. There's even use cases both in the Apple demo and in other demos from creators where you can do AR and VR at the same time. So, for example, in the in the dinosaurs experience in Apple's demo, um, there's like a rectangle where you're looking through to a portal to prehistoric uh, dinosaurs and they peek through the portal at you, come through the plane in a very real way. Um, and then... I've actually seen examples where um, you can actually walk into that frame and now you're immersed in that world, not in the dinosaur example, but in other ones. And then you turn around and you look back at the real world through a rectangle, which is trippy and amazing. So we'll see all kinds of incredible experimentation with use cases like that. That that This is a case where mixed reality is actually in some ways better than true transparent augmented reality. Great. However, there is a big asterisk that no one's really talking about, which I think is very important to call out, which is that at this moment in innovation, all these displays are fixed focal length. That means that your eyes are focused at the screens and at, a, at the same focal length for the entire experience. Even though the, the, the things that you're seeing are in three dimensions, your eyes aren't actively refocusing because they don't have to. Okay, well, that seems okay, except for I will just state that there are known health benefits around staying in a fixed focal length setting for a long period of time. Um, now, there, there's a whole bunch of ways to address that. In particular, there's variable focal lenses called varifocal lenses that allow your eyeballs to be able to focus on both real world items and um, and on digital items at their appropriate focal plane. But we're not there yet as an industry and, and none of those systems have been built at scale yet. So I just want to state that like if you're thinking that you're going to wear this all day, every day, there are real health reasons not to do that. And it also contributes on a smaller scale to like a type of fatigue that might not be obvious. A lot of people think about the um, the sensation of VR sickness uh, or motion sickness if a VR system is low frame rate or not designed well, uh, or if you're moving but you're not moving, all these things that lead to kind of discomfort. I'm super resilient to those types of things, but I will state that when I'm, when I'm doing like 3D sculpture in AR for many, many um, hours and then I remove the headset, it does feel bad in a way that's hard to articulate and it's related to this kind of visual pass-through fatigue. So no one's really mentioned that. I just want to mention that that's a real thing. That leads me to my next item is that most, so uh, this we'll call it chapter four, is most of the applications for spatial computing that you see in the Vision Pro are presenting two-dimensional content in a three-dimensional environment. Now, yes, of course, they do have the dinosaurs example. They do have 
Avatar, uh, you know, the 3D movie, which you're viewing, you know, uh, in a rectangle inside your real world. That's all very amazing. But but these are all still, for the most part, like linear content that sort of plays. You push play, it plays, you experience it. Um, and also screens hovering in the real world, whether they're browser screens or movie screens or or app screens that are hovering around you. I just want to state that I've spent many, many hours interacting with two-dimensional screens and three-dimensional environments in current generation headsets. And I will mention that although the pass-through resolution isn't amazing on the Quest 3, the actual foveal resolution of like a, a, a page of text is very, very good in the Quest 3 for 500 bucks. So like you can use a browser or you can watch a movie really, really well in those systems today. The real world might look not look incredible, but the but the artificial content looks very good. And I just want to state that like those use cases are amazing demos because it just makes sense to the person who's experiencing it for the first time. But they fall into this category of content that I use the acronym CBNU, or sometimes I use the term CBNF, cool but not useful or cool but not fun, <laughs> right? So it's you put it on, you're like, this is amazing. This feels like the future. But um, you're not really drawn to, to compute that way all day, every day. And I don't personally believe that having more pixels thrown at that problem is going to solve that. Um, and I'm reminded of like the early days of motion pictures. You know, let's just remember that the first motion pictures just filmed people on stage in a play because it took us quite a while, decades actually, to learn that, that a motion picture was a fundamentally different creative medium than a play. And we could actually move the camera. We could do close-ups. We could do special effects. And now we, we take that for granted in this new medium called movies and television that's very different than a live stage performance. We're at that moment right now in spatial computing, right? Where a lot of the uh, a lot of the use cases that you're seeing in spatial computing, particularly in the in the Vision Pro, are the same exact use cases. In some cases, the same literal app that you're using unmodified in spatial computing. It's just a, 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 a you know two dimensional rectangle hovering in your three dimensional world, and that is cool, right? Like KC Nestad is talking about, like watching high quality videos at the subway stop, right? That's magical in its own way. I will just state, given the current form factor of the device, you know, since it's not, doesn't look like glasses just yet, I'm not sure that that use case will actually play out in reality. I think it makes for fun YouTube content, but I don't imagine people are going to be wearing these things out and about in their environment. Um, so I'm not sure that the, that the actual end user benefit of bringing two-dimensional screens with you everywhere you go on a computer that's strapped to your face really um, it is as compelling as you think, which raises the question, what are the applications that are compelling in spatial computing this five minutes? And I have an answer to that too. I think that actually merits a different video, which I might, might create, which speaks to like, what are the five ways that I use spatial computing every day? And they might be non-obvious, like sculptural sketching, um, fitness, uh, all kinds of cool ways to use spatial computing that's not games, um, and, and kind of spills into productivity even, uh, that, that is applications for augmented, uh, mixed and virtual reality. So I might speak to that later. Um, but in, in summary, what I would say is that the thing you should do, uh, after watching this video, if you're peaked, if, if you peaked your interest enough to click on the video and, and you're still watching the content, the next thing you should absolutely do is go to apple.com and schedule yourself for a demo slot. Um, again, it's about a 20 minute demo. If you go on non peak times, you can usually um, ask a few more questions and get it extended to about 30 minutes. But I would maybe just recommend that you try and pick a non peak time, you know, 11 o'clock on a Tuesday or sometime when you think that, that it's not going to be super crowded uh, for two reasons. Number one, you know, preserve the peak times to the to those who have a high likelihood of buying the device uh, and are test driving it before handing their credit card over. But but more importantly, um, if you pick a non-peak time, as I did, you're more likely to be able to kind of see a few more experiences. Like I got to see the dinosaurs thing, which is in the demo grid, but not in the demo script. Um, or I did the meditation experience, which again is is available to uh, to demo um, uh, cast members, but not necessarily part of the part of the demo flow. So I'd recommend that you try and try and do that. Um, but all in all, I mean, the experience is like, there's no reason not to do this. You could absolutely justify probably an hour of your time, including transit to and from an Apple store in a major metro area <laughs> to be able to experience this. Because even if you're very versed, even if you own a Quest 3 and you've done a lot of color pass through, the the level of fidelity execution, fit and finish of this is, is so much better that it does uh, deserve that that experience from you. I'm not sure that it, and I think in most cases, it probably won't 
won't deserve $3,500 of your hard earned dollars. Um, but I would say that if you're like somewhere between like you did the demo, you're not quite ready to part with $3,500 to get this device. And maybe you want more of these immersive interactive experiences. I still think the Quest 3 at, you know, let's call it 600 bucks with the with the better head headband is an incredible value, an incredible device will give you a whole host of great experiences, including uh, a mixed reality um, and for a fraction of the cost. And if you really love it and and you say, actually, you're wrong, I am using it, that 2D and 3D environment really speaks to me, great. You can sell it on eBay for you know, 100 bucks less than you paid and then go to the go to the Apple store and buy the, 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 the Vision Pro. So all of this is to say that I do truly believe to the core of my being that this is an important waypoint in our journey to truly spatial computing. You know, it's so interesting. We, we've spent tens of thousands of years evolving wetware to allow us to interact with things in a three-dimensional space. Yet, unfortunately, all of our communication technologies in the last 50 years and even, you know, parchment and, and uh, cave walls for hundreds of thousands of years, you know, those are... Uh, those are two-dimensional mediums. So we've been projecting three-dimensional objects into two-dimensional spaces for many, many uh, generations. And I think this is a really important moment in time where we can actually compute in a way that is authentic to our reality. And that is important. So I continue to be super enthusiastic about the long-term potential of spatial computing as a category. And I'm in awe of Apple's graceful execution uh, of their first device in, in that space. So um, again, give it a test drive. Really curious to hear what you think about it. And, uh, and thanks for your time.